This is carbonated brown sugar water, and this is Coca-Cola. To an impartial observer, these two products may seem identical, but in the world of business, this little red can makes all the difference. It's a name so gargantuan that even mentioning it feels redundant. Their logo is about as recognizable as the sun, the moon, and the stars. Across the history of human commerce, no other company even comes close to their longevity and scope. Chat, chat, you want, you, you want something, chat? Let me, let me tell you something, okay? You know people say, oh, dude, do the Coke challenge. Coke. Dude, if you cannot do the Coke challenge, you're a fucking rookie cock lord, okay? I can distinguish a Coke from any beverage whatsoever out there, back to back, thousands of times in a row, with not failing a single time. And it's not even hard. We will act like it is. Their product is available in so many markets that it's far easier to list the places that don't sell it. The Coke empire has penetrated all corners of the earth, and even a little bit beyond that. They are the envy of the business world, architects of the single most valuable brand. So to wash mouth out after XQCL known. great when running street. A company, yeah, it's easy to believe that branding is everything. Take away this red and white label, and what exactly do you have left? It's tempting to consider whether you could sell someone anything as long as it's behind those same familiar colors they know and love. Forty years ago, Coca-Cola was thinking the very same thing, and nearly paid the ultimate price. Mm -hmm. In my last video I talked about Mac Tonight, the most successful ad campaign that McDonald's ever ran. The character was a spiritual successor to Mac's headroom. A memorable mascot for Coca-Cola, which showed up on television at around the same who is time. That? Max Headroom was truly a bizarre character, but even more bizarre were the series of events which led to his adoption. It's the 1980s, and Coca-Cola is quickly approaching its hundredth year as a business. The company brass aren't celebrating, however, as for the first time that nearly anyone can remember. Coke is in danger of losing its title as America's favorite soft drink. Bitter rival Pepsi Cola has spent the past several decades slowly chipping away at Coke's dominant market share of the beverage industry. By 1985, Pepsi was on the verge of the unthinkable, overtaking Coke as the leading cola brand. That can't happen. The consumer market on which Coke had built their empire was rapidly changing. The health risks of soda were starting to be scrutinized, what and Jack? aging customers had begun switching to low-calorie options like diet colas. This demographic shift meant that future sales of Coke's flagship product would have to rely on the younger generation, a generation who tended to prefer Pepsi. By the 80s, oh, Pepsi no, had Zoomers. already started outselling Coke in supermarkets, with Coke hanging on to the overall lead through restaurants and vending machines. If the market trends continued, that lead wouldn't last much longer. However, as the old masters of the industry, Coke wasn't going down without a fight. That fight would come from their new chairman, Roberto Goizueta. Who? Although he took over the company reins at a very troublesome time, the Cuban-born magnate was no stranger to trouble. In the 1950s, shortly after getting promoted to head of Coke's Havana bottling plant, Goizueta defected to the United States in the wake of Fidel Castro's communist revolution. Over the next 30 years, he methodically worked his way up the company ladder until 1980, when he was finally promoted to the most influential seat in the beverage industry. Mr. Goizueta had quite the origin story, but a necessary one for understanding his mentality towards change. For decades, Coca-Cola had marketed their product on the tradition boomers. and permanence. They had built a mythical aura around their elusive secret formula, the, the very backbone of the company's monumental success. The formula's lineage could be traced all the way back to its inventor, John Pemberton, who then sold it to company founder Asa Candler. Within a decade, the Coke formula was selling in every American state becoming the eminent national beverage by the turn of the 20th century. Not long afterward, company president Robert Woodrow yeah, no, would extend so good. the taste of Coke to the rest of the world, oh, damn. ushering in the most dominant period in company history. By 1948, Coke controlled an estimated 60% market share of the beverage industry, 
distributing their iconic product on a global scale. That's fucking Millions busted. Millions of customers across hundreds of countries, all enjoying the same formula that had remained virtually unchanged for nearly a century. It was Coca-Cola's golden goose, the real thing. Altering it would be like rewriting the Bible. And that's how the company thought, until Roberto Goizueta became chairman. By 1984, the company's mighty 60% market share had shrunk to just over 20%. Listen, lucky. Decades of complacency had allowed Coke's competition to get back in the race, and Goizueta was poised to put a stop to it. After becoming chairman, he boldly announced that there would be no more sacred cows in the company philosophy. In the next few years, he followed through on that claim by introducing two landmark products, Diet Coke and Cherry Coke. Oh, it was damn. the first time the company had debuted any new product under the Coke name. While both options proved to be quite popular, they only sought to further compete with the company's flagship product, which was still losing ground to Pepsi. Oh, that's, okay, Carrying yeah, that's the pretty pride bad. of one of America's most that's dangerous institutions. Coke was yes, I feel like this is dangerous because people people get uh, get over novelty and the fact that something is new and cool really fast, and that can mean that they're gonna switch from a Coke entirely, right? to something else, right? They go Coke to Coke uh, a chair or whatever, and then, oh yeah, now it's gonna old, now they go, they swap entirely. With I think no that's choice. risky. In a time of Cold War tensions, Roberto Guizueta had to resort to the nuclear option. Oh, what a time, it's gonna be Pepsi now. The winning taste is Pepsi. It's gonna be, gotta be, gonna be Pepsi now. Taste for Pepsi. A major factor behind Coke's declining market share was an ad campaign known as the Pepsi Challenge, a blind taste test between the two colas that appeared to show an overall preference for the sweeter flavor of Pepsi. Fuck While off! Not exactly scientific. The fake news. I'm done with the video already. I don't want it anymore. This is just fake. Many consumers this is just to fake. switch to the blue brand. This led Coke to conclude that the only way to stop Pepsi was to beat them at their own game. It was then when Coke's senior executives commissioned a secret assignment known as Project Kansas, where company scientists were tasked with concocting a superior formula. Soon enough, they had synthesized the ultimate flavor, one that could consistently beat both Pepsi and the original Coke in a taste test. With a potential new juggernaut on their hands, the company was now faced with a tough decision. Sprite. They could release the new drink as a standalone product, and risk further diluting the already crowded Coke lineup. Or they could do the unthinkable, and replace the cornerstone of their entire brand. Ultimately, the choice was up to Roberto Goizueta, who would look to his past for guidance. Years earlier, when he was in charge of Caribbean distribution, Goizueta had successfully boosted sales by slightly tweaking the Coke formula. He had already once committed the cardinal sin, but perhaps he saw it as a virtue. For Goizueta, the choice was clear. Coca-Cola, the product that he had sold for his entire adult life, was on the way out. And so, the Coca-Cola company was set to make the single ballsiest move in the entire history of their business, replacing the very thing from which they were named. As the story goes, shortly before the launch, huh? Roberto Goizueta sought out the blessing of his predecessor, Robert Woodruff the man who had built Coke into the behemoth that it was. No one knows for sure what Woodruff really thought about the decision, because he wouldn't live to see it happen. In March 1985, Coca-Cola's most legendary executive passed away at the age of 95. That, one wow. month later, the company launched Wait a minute, Coke. what? 95? In what year? In March 1985, Coca-Cola's most legendary executive passed away at the age of 95. Oh, wow. One month later, the company launched New Coke. The events that followed were not 95? In 95? That's Coke. fucking insane. Coca-Cola is a pretty big company. That's stolen? Buying one of their products really isn't going to matter one way or the other. Where your purchase can matter is through a business like Bespoke Post. They're a subscription box service that helps out small brands from all across. You can either swap yeah, yeah. dot com. I bought, I, bought, I bought eight of them. I bought 20. Now I, I, I live to worry for it. about Amp Energy. I'm sure that this fan favorite flavor isn't going away anytime soon. 
simply stated, my friends, we have a new formula for Coke. Well, the real thing is in for a real oh. change these days. Ja, and there wasn't. Boom, five bed. The big reveal is that they say it's a new formula, but it was a new formula. And it played in people's heads. It made him, made him... 99 year old secret <laughs> recipe. On April 23rd, 1985, new Coke was rolled out nationwide. Over the next two weeks, the remaining supply of the original formula would be phased out of supermarkets and restaurants. The change nope. was paired with an immediate new marketing campaign from company spokesman Bill Cosby. Initial sales oh. of the product appeared promising. Early data from select markets were in line with projections. Roberto Goizueta confidently stood by his new product, already touting his decision as a success. The celebration was a tad premature, however, as trouble was brewing beneath Coke's triumphant hubris. Soon afterward, the company would find themselves struggling to stay afloat in a tidal wave of backlash, one that spawned right in their own backyard. Across its entire operational history, Coca-Cola has been headquartered in or near Atlanta, Georgia, the heart of the American South. It's a part of the country which prides itself on a distinct regional identity, uh -oh. one that often runs contrary to the rest of the U.S. For generations, many Southerners considered Coca-Cola as hallowed as barbecue and college football. It is their bona fide beverage of choice, so much so Mascar. that to this very day, many Southerners still use the word Coke to refer to all soft drinks. For as long as they've been in business, Coca-Cola has relied on the South as a sales stronghold. The fierce brand loyalty of the region may have led what to- What if you go to McDonald's drive through Uh, mate, can I, can, I get, can I get a drink? Yeah, what do you want? Coke. Which one, you fucking bum? A Coke. Which one? Which fucking Coke? Are you okay? More on it. Leadership, who developed an expectation that Southern customers would welcome any change with open arms. Following the release of new Coke, this assumption would be proven dead wrong. Shortly after the switch, the prevailing sentiment in the South was one of abject betrayal. For many, it represented yet works. another pillar of Southern tradition that had been surrendered to the Yankees. Announcing the product smack dab in the middle of New York City certainly didn't help this perception. Wait, With the change, Coke had effectively alienated their most diehard supporters. Emotions among the former faithful ranged from indignant to irate. More than 40,000 letters of protest quickly piled up in Coca-Cola's office mailbox. Letters? The Coke hotline was inundated with thousands of distraught callers per day. A company hired psychiatrists who listened in to some of the messages observed some customers acting as if they had lost a family member. Needless to say, the reaction was much more severe than what was anticipated. Questions immediately loomed as to why the company didn't bother to run more tests in their home market. What little testing Coke did do in the South revealed a narrow preference for the new formula. Company leadership saw this slight majority as justification for the change. What they failed to consider, however, were the 10% of respondents who were vehemently against it. In a controlled survey, Makes people sense. can't influence each other's opinions. But in the real world, it's not that simple. While most people were ambivalent about new Coke, those who disliked it really disliked it. This vocal minority would end up tarnishing the new formula in the eyes of the entire general public. Oh my Even god, he's the Karen's! the consumer didn't personally mind the switch, they likely knew someone who did. This common circumstance led to frequent cases where drinking new Coke could potentially place someone in an awkward social situation. For many, it was simply easier to avoid judgment and order something else. The influence of peer pressure would start to significantly impact sales, as consumers were now hesitant to embrace a product which so many found undesirable. All of a sudden, Coke was facing a major problem, one that extended far beyond the South. People from all across the country were starting to get the impression that for the first time anyone could remember, a Coca-Cola product had missed the mark. New Coke and the swelling controversy behind it had become a national fascination. There's a saying in business that no, all publicity bad, is yeah, good publicity, I was gonna say. but for Coke's new formula, 
it was simply not the case. Yeah, because when you had the nervous, not at all. We've never had more fun in our life. We this wasn't a frivolous decision. I think this is true when you dominate the market, when everybody knows, when everybody knows. It's something that we have worked on, John, over the last four years. In the weeks after the debut, New Coke had become easy fodder for late-night comedians and bored journalists. The media kept reporting on eccentric stories about just how far certain people had gone to express their displeasure towards the switch. There was the story of Dan Locke, an avid Coke drinker from San Antonio, who was apparently so mortified by the new Coke announcement that he immediately went out and stockpiled 110 cases of the original formula. Speaking of stockpiles, a few quick-thinking opportunists would use the hysteria to their advantage. A Beverly Hills man named Dennis Overstreet bought 500 cases of the old formula for resale at his wine business. After one month, he had customers lining up around the block trying to scoop up the last of his supply. Guys, guys. Overstreet's guys, when I was young, okay, I remember I, we were going to school my, with my dad, okay, and it went next to the, the gas station, okay, and the gas was, was 0.62, okay, I remember it was 0.62 per liter, okay, and, after, and he said, oh, wow, today's gas prices are fucking insane, and I'm like, what if we buy a big-ass tanker as big as our whole backyard, and we just pump that bitch ass, right, full of gas over and over again, and later on, we just resell it, right? And I was like, ah, you know, it's, it's, it's a smart idea, you know, but you know, you can't do that. But what if you could do that? Today when I, I went, I went, I went next door, and it was two sixteen. That would have been a three point four x profit, three point four x value. Three bucks. That's insane. Sold them the old cases for more than double what he paid. Oh, for it them. goes bad. The newfound scarcity of the old formula led many to scour some of the most rural areas for any remaining product. When America's domestic supply was completely exhausted, a few loyalists resorted to smuggling in the old formula from foreign countries who had not yet made the switch. Unfortunately, other forms of protest weren't so bad. Uh, I don't play the video. Out of Marietta, Georgia, featured a woman accosting a Coke delivery man with an umbrella while shouting about how they had ruined the flavor. But by far the king of new Coke hostility was a Seattle man by the name of Gay Mullins, who would use $100,000 of his own money to found a new organization for enemies of the new formula. Under Mullins' leadership, the old cola drinkers of America would declare war against New Coke. His battle tactics included selling anti-New Coke merchandise, spamming the hotline with complaints, and organizing mass protests which dumped gallons of New Coke into the local sewer. At one point, what? Mullins even attempted to file a class action lawsuit against the soda giant, but it was quickly dismissed. The constant hijinks would attract a ton of media attention to the movement, helping to grow Mullen's army to as much as a hundred thousand strong. That's just pure illness! While acts of dissent were small in scope and petty in nature, their influence was tremendous. Together, these minor demonstrations effectively counteracted millions of dollars of Coca-Cola marketing. For as much as Coke tried to salvage the image of their new product, the American public was sticking to their own narrative. It was only a matter of time before everyone saw New Coke as the most despised beverage in the nation. To make matters even worse, New Coke had crossed the threshold where it was simply fun to hate. During a baseball game at Houston's Astrodome, the crowd in attendance would infamously erupt in boos any time a New Coke ad flashed on the Jumbotron. Oh my god. By this point, the backlash had far exceeded just a few oddballs. It now resembled a full-fledged cultural event. Part of the morbid curiosity that attracted people to the controversy was tied up in the novelty of seeing such a powerful company struggle. Coca-Cola was supposed to be the shining example of American excellence. They almost never slipped up, so when they did, people made sure to let them know about it. Lots of people who didn't even necessarily care about the product found entertainment value in rallying against a Goliath corporation who True. had fallen a bit too far out of touch. For many, New Coke became an issue of patriotism, with one Alabama reporter even insinuating that the whole idea was a communist plot to destroy a champion of American ingenuity. This theory wouldn't quite hold up after Fidel Castro, a longtime Coke drinker, published his own comments bashing the new formula. 
Ironically, Castro had <laughs> arguably set off this entire series of events in the first place by launching Roberto. Oh wait, guys, guys, I feel, I feel like this drinker published his own. This is giving a free instant like blow, uh, like a home run against the idea of capitalism if if they did it right, right? Comments bashing the new formula. Ironically, Castro had arguably set off this entire series of events in the Wait, first place about it by launching Roberto Goizueta on his journey to become. No, I'm a back. I'm a backwards. Or it could it, it could have helped the cause of fixing it if he did say that he liked it and he acted like it and he said, "Yeah, man, this is like this is this is the true communist drink." Then people would this would have cut on fire backwards. Helped. Yeah, yeah we would have. Yeah. Watching his bold decision catastrophically backfire. Nope. Goizueta's ultimate humiliation would come from the words of his father. What? Who told him that the release of new coke was the only time he ever yes, could have. with Castro. In the first month after release, Coke's management remained committed to their I'll product my, my and tried science. to weather the storm. But by the end of May, the situation was quickly becoming Seven untenable. minutes away. First they said they were the real thing, then they said they were it. Then kablooey, they changed. So now, I'm gonna try my first Pepsi. The company's what? strategy to poach business away from Pepsi was backfiring spectacularly. Shortly after New Coke hit store shelves, Pepsi saw a 14% sales increase, the biggest in their entire history. In mid-June, when soft drink sales typically rise, New Coke sales remain flat. Internally, Coca-Cola's officials were starting to panic. Amid complaints over the flavor of their new product, the company would quietly alter the formula yet again, this time adjusting its acidity. It was clear that Coke's leadership were losing faith in their vision. A few executives had already begun suggesting a return to the old formula. The last hope for new Coke was the product catching on in foreign markets. But after seeing the fiasco taking place in the US, Coke's international distributors wanted no part of it. Domestically, the company's own bottling partners were on the brink of revolt. New Coke was now threatening to dismantle the very structure of their business. With no other options, the company swallowed their pride and submitted to the will of the people. No! One of us looked at the other and said, what are we doing? <laughs> what, what, what are we doing here? In the latest battle of the Cola Wars, Coke says it's bringing back its old formula. Within the next several weeks, the original taste, which many people in the country apparently missed, will be redemption story again. Well, we read and we listened, and you know the rest. They're both yours. The new taste of Coke and Coca-Cola Classic. Your right of choice is back. On July 11, 1985, Coca-Cola announced the return of the original formula, ending the new Coke experiment after just 79 days. The new formula would continue to be sold as simply Coke, taking a back seat to the rightful flagship product, now called Coca-Cola Classic. Following the controversy, longtime spokesman Bill Cosby would part ways with the company, claiming that promoting new Coke had hurt his credibility. This That's ironic. Coke with a vacancy in their marketing Jesus Christ. Which would soon be filled by the Sir? Max Headroom. <laughs> Sir? Coke. Despite the very entertaining ad campaign, new Coke's reputation could not be salvaged. By the end of the 80s, its sales had dwindled to just a few percent of the market before the company decided to shelve it. In 1992, they attempted to reintroduce the new formula as Coke 2, which okay. went about as well as Sir. you may have imagined. Sir. Okay, that's After that's a few worse. years, the product would be mostly discontinued once more, only sticking around in a few that's, select is that like Overwatch the too? country. Roberto Goizueta, the mastermind behind it all, continued to swear by his creation. He personally drank the product until his death in 1997. Although he oversaw one of the biggest blunders in company history, his tenure was still considered a success. New Coke was expected to revive the Coca-Cola brand, and in a totally unorthodox way, it did just that, by making people realize just how much they enjoyed the original formula. The return of Coke Classic led to nationwide euphoria. Sales figures not only rebounded, but went on to surpass what the brand had been doing prior to the switch. In just six months, Coca-Cola was selling more than twice as fast as Pepsi, solidifying their place as the top soda company in the world.
a position they continue to hold to this day. Oh, wow. Somehow, the biggest failure in industry history had directly contributed to its biggest success. Redemption. A story so perfect that it led many to wonder whether it was planned all along. The incident sparked a variety of other conspiracies as to the company's true intentions with the new formula. Some speculated that the change oh, was in response down. to the Reagan administration's war on drugs, with Coke having to phase out. They are just cringe, insecure Andes who see all other people who attempt something that they wouldn't, right? As something fabricated and fake and pre-planned. They see other people that dare to take the leap as something so foreign that it's got to be made the up. The last remnants of the coca plant from which they're named. Whether Weird. or not this was the case remains dubious. But a far more likely explanation had to do with the company shifting from cane sugar to the far cheaper alternative of high fructose <clears throat> corn syrup. Strangely enough, Coke Classic wasn't exactly the same as Classic Coke. The returning formula had entirely switched to using corn syrup as a sweetener. Gay Mullins, who received the ironic. very first can of Coke Classic, reported feeling sick after drinking it. Many other astute consumers had their suspicions about the apparent bait and switch. But for the vast majority, it simply didn't matter. They had complained and Coke had listened, which at the end of the day, is all anyone really wanted. See? In guys, you know, remember when I tell you guys that the consumer doesn't know what know what the fuck they want, right? That's that's a good Nine, example of that. Coca-Cola officially they don't know the what they want. From their they packaging, do not. Effectively erasing the last trace of New Coke's existence. The company was surely eager to move on from such an embarrassing chapter of their history. Since then, the, people the debacle is has stupid. mostly faded away into a distant memory. I was born far too late to experience the summer of New Coke. The stories I heard felt guys, like something of guys, an urban legend. Democracy by the people, for the people, but the people... A forbidden elixir which caused so much heartache that it was practically banished from public consumption. An artifact so unwanted that it became unobtainable. I've spent the past month trying to study it, and after examining just about every aspect of the stuff, I was still missing one crucial detail. First, because democracy basically means government. By the people, of the people, for the people. But the people are retarded. As much research I've done, the literature, the footage, and the data don't tell the full story. After dedicating so much effort trying to understand New Coke, the only thing left to do was taste it. <laughs> How do you even drink that? Because it's delicious. What? In 2019, New Coke experienced a brief revival after being featured on the hit Netflix series Stranger Things. As part of a promotional stunt, yeah, Coca-Cola would release a limited run of the 1985 formula. Only 500,000 cans were distributed, with a few winding up for resale on eBay. So I picked up a case, and for the first time in my life, tried the flavor that whipped an entire nation into a frenzy. And to be perfectly honest, it was kind of hard to taste the difference. It's probably because I don't drink soda often or that I hadn't tasted a Coke Another in a while, non connoisseur I tell the two drinks apart. Funnily enough, even a guy like Gay Mullins, New Coke's most ardent critic, couldn't tell either. After finally experiencing the world's most infamous beverage for myself, I couldn't help but speculate about a pretty absurd thought. My drinks? Does anyone actually know what Coca-Cola tastes like? It seems like such a preposterous thing to suggest, but research tells us that most people don't. Unlike Arriving what the marketing now. may tell you, independent taste tests have consistently shown that the average person can't tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi. For most of us, taste is just not our strong suit. Food marketing professor Joel Dubo found that incremental adjustments to soft drink flavor tend to go unnoticed by consumers. 
meaning that new coke could have theoretically succeeded had it been gradually consolidated with the old formula. This is especially interesting, since many people today believe that new coke failed because it was a bad product. But in my personal assessment, that's simply not the case. In fact, after going back and really comparing the two drinks, I actually preferred the flavor of the new formula. I ordered three bottles of it Coke, was good enough to three bottles of Pepsi, and five cans of Pepsi because option. I have cans of Coke upstairs. The product itself was fine, and had it been excellent. I can literally tell you the difference between bottled Coke and canned Coke, bottled Pepsi and canned... I can tell you but the all four. You did a little I different. can tell you before, all it four. It as successful as any other Coke flavor. The problem with New Coke had to do almost entirely with how it was presented to the public. Coke may have envisioned the product as the ultimate answer to the Pepsi challenge, but they only ended up challenging themselves. The very idea of replacing the most legendary consumer product in history was just too brazen for the video, though, I enjoyed to it. accept. New Coke was unknowingly pitted against 99 years of marketing genius, and in hindsight, it it's unsurprising to see which side prevailed. At the end of the day, all the research, focus groups, and taste tests were irrelevant. New Coke never stood a chance for the simple reason that it wasn't the real thing. It wasn't Coca-Cola. But what is Coca-Cola really? Is it carbonated sugar water? Is it 19th century headache tonic? I've got a feeling that for most people, Coke isn't even supposed to taste I'm not nervous at all. I'm good at this. All it has to do is taste how they remember. There's something to be said about a product that has lasted longer than virtually any other. Okay. One that first.